This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. You know, what John said is right, you know, the, what brought me uh, and Citrix to Santa Barbara was this amazing team with amazing set of ideas and, um, you know, and a great business that really fits Citrix in an amazing way. But what really got the deal done was the common set of values and culture that we all shared. Um, and uh, that's what really allows you to build great, great businesses and teams, and I'm going to try to talk a little bit about that with you uh, this evening. So John asked me to tell war stories, and you know, I didn't have to have any charts and everything, but so I'm going to try to set things up so we can talk about some war stories and maybe give you a little insight on um, how we've come this journey as a company and maybe a little bit, you know, how we've come this journey for myself personally. And then I'll try to bring those two things together to show you how those things actually are expressing where we are going as a company between here, which I'll have a few updated numbers. So this year we'll do about two and a half to 2.6 billion, okay? And uh, our next big goal um, is 5 billion, okay? Uh, in terms of scale and size. And so uh, we can talk a little bit about that and how we imagine that um, first, and then we become that second, okay? So that's what we're going to try to do in the next, whatever, hour and a half or something like that. And what you should do is really feel good about interrupting. You know, you can raise your hand, you can shout out um, for, you know, any purpose, a question or a comment, whatever, because that's how we all get a lot of value out of this um, through uh, being interactive. I asked John to stop me, you know, at places where he thinks might be important. So when I joined Citrix in, by the way, in 1995, um, the, the company was already six years old, right? And 50 people in the company. And um, the, as far as I'm concerned, I had the luckiest, best timing in the world because the company had been through all the really ugly parts of a startup, running out of money several times, several product failures, several turnovers of senior management. And I got there when things were, you know, reasonably stable and the company had a reasonable business model to then try to scale and grow on. And, um, and at that time, the company's idea was all about connecting people to remote apps. That was it. And so during this era of the company, which I consider to be sort of the, you know, 95 to around 2000, everything that we did was about remote access. You know, anyone who traveled had to work remotely. All right, we had a solution for that person to work remotely, to get to, to important applications that uh, were back at the headquarters. So the remote access era. But we only had, let me, let me back up here. So at the time we had exactly one product, okay? And uh, we went from 15 million in 1995, 96, 45 million, 97, 125 million, 98, Four, uh, 250 million, 99, 400 million, all right? 2000, 470 million, so slowed a little bit. 2001, all right, 590 million, all right? So, so that, that was our trajectory 
um, over this remote access era. So a little bit of a bump in 2000, you know, picked up in 2001, and then 2002 happened. 527 million, boom, all right? So we had one product, we were really optimizing around a single product, and we knew we had to invent something new and something different, but something that we could take to market. So when we sat down and we said, what can we do? And we imagined a whole world driven by remote access, with remote access at the core. So I call this the Copernican strategy model. Remember Copernicus? Remember what Copernicus thought um, uh, versus Galileo, right? All right, I'll remind you. Galileo said the sun is the center of the solar system, all right, and we're just orbiting around it. Copernicus said, no, the Earth is the center of the solar system, and we're, you know, the most important entity in the solar system, and everything was orbiting around us. So we use this Copernican model to actually change the reality of the world so that we can imagine the things that are adjacent and revolving around us. And that allowed us to imagine remote access connected to remotely accessing people, using different kinds of business models like software as a service, which less led us to you know, the acquisition of ex ex Expert City, and other kinds of networking technologies and virtualization technologies that allowed us to imagine a whole universe around us that we could look at as adjacent to the world that we're in. And to do that, we actually wrote a lot of things down, but the main thing that we did is we made a video, believe it or not, okay? In 2001, we made a video called The Virtual Workplace. And The Virtual Workplace, now this, I'll start this back up. There's no sound to this. It was basically a seven minute video that expressed about 10 different ideas about how people would be able to roam smoothly between devices, work, you know, large screen, small screen, integration into mobile uh, uh, devices like your car, all right? Agents that would respond like Siri, if, if you, uh, you know, know Siri. You know, dual screen, touch screen devices that could then work with large screens to al allow collaboration with video, audio, sharing documents smoothly and, and seamlessly, all right? And do this all without service interruption because it was built on a really powerful foundation that was resilient to um, various types of normal interruptions in service that everyone sees every day. So we made that video in 2001, okay? And that video described the course that we, we would be on to reinvent the company for the next era, and that next era uh, was about separating the physical from the logical. So we, uh, uh, Expert City became a part of Citrix in the fourth quarter of 2003, which was really at the tail end of the era of connecting people to remote apps. So go to my PC was very, very important uh, in that acquisition. But was, what was as important were the ideas around collaboration, okay, and being able to virtualize where and how people work together, right? And so the second era of the company was about separating physical from logical or the virtual computing era of the company. So it turns out when you separate physical from logical, you can do all kinds of really interesting things, all right? Um, you can work across multiple devices and locations and boundaries around uh, corporate boundaries, organizational boundaries, et cetera, and people you know, could actually um, collaborate and work anywhere. So um, this really set the foundation for the second era of the company, and we've seen a lot of amazing growth uh, in the company since in this era, uh, where uh, since 2006, we've invested a lot, over two and a half billion dollars in R&D and uh, strategic acquisitions. Uh, and you can see from 2001 to, through last year, kind of how Citrix really, you know, became a very different company. So in 2001, 100% of our uh, business came from sort of the Windows application and desktop virtualization uh, business. Um, last year, that was 62% of our business. 
and our SaaS online businesses around collaboration, 19%, and our cloud infrastructure and platform business about 19%. So this gives you a sense for you know, the kind of transformation that the company uh, went through during that second era. All right. So now we're, uh, this year, about 2.6 billion in revenue, a little over 7,000 employees today. And as John mentioned, uh, over 10,000 business partners around the world in 100 com com countries, uh, helping us to spread the good word of Citrix and touch a lot, a lot of customers. Um, by the way, the reason we touch 75% of all internet users is a Citrix product sits in front of little websites like Google and Amazon and Yahoo and MSN, all right, eBay, uh, iCloud, uh, iTunes, uh, most of the big betting sites in the world, all right? Most of the ma uh, major sports uh, sites in the world, like Major League Baseball and, you know, and so forth. And it's a product called Netscaler. And what it does is basically provide security and acceleration for those websites so that we, as consumers of them, get a great experience. It's fast and it's really secure and, uh, you know, it keeps us coming back. So we shorten the cycles around clicks. Um, so we're now in the third era of the company's evolution, and that's the era of actually starting to take all these pieces that we separated and bring them all back together by integrating them in the way that people can work better and live better, or integrating business and personal life. And this is where we're completely now focused on two big ideas, mobile and cloud. Yes, sir. Does it work? I don't think it works. Um, anyways, uh, I was I was curious how you came to have uh, like ten thousand business partners and like more than your employees and like what like a majority of them do right like, with you. Okay, good question. So, um, first of all, it's about leverage, so that you know we multiply our efforts through the efforts of business partners. All right, so that's the business concept underlying it. Secondly, the 10,000 partners will include um, very small local sort of VARs, resellers that focus on a very small type customer segment in a very local market, all the way up through the world's largest system integrators like IBM and Tata and um, you know, EDS and uh, Accenture and so forth, uh, Computer Science Corporation, et cetera. So, and there are a lot of them, as it turns out. And to get the kind of market coverage that we need to grow the way we grow, you know, you need to reach customers effectively and efficiently in ways that we can't possibly do on our own. And that's the purpose of our business partners. Okay? So hopefully that, that helps. Okay? So from here forward, you know, in this era, it's all about mobile and the move to mobile and the cloud and the move to, move to cloud services. And what is driving all this is what I believe is a fundamental reinvention of how people work, how we build computing systems, kind of how IT works, all right, and how business works in terms of globalization, breaking you know, traditional boundaries and business models that are you know, very, very traditional in terms of old school, backward looking. So this is what's happening in the world. Our perspective and um, happening um, on a global basis. So we uh, are an interesting company that's built around a very special culture. And, you know, it's kind of a cult, all right? It's a, and it's a special cult where, you know, we all have a lot of fun together and nobody dies, okay? <laughs> uh, and um, so, you know, here you go and do it alone. It's weird, okay? But when you do it with others, it's a club, all right? And that's what a culture is. It's about a club, and it's about everyone belonging to something that they believe in, all right, and something that they believe in that's of a greater and higher purpose and bigger, something larger than them, okay? So that's a really core idea and belief of mine and of, of Citrix's, okay? And that the fundamental motivation for people in a business 
is to do something important that, that they believe in that's of greater importance than themselves as an individual. So, you know, getting a paycheck, supporting your family, those are all important things, but they're not special. There are a million places you can go to do that, all right? What makes, I believe, Citrix special is this belief is at the core and foundation of the company. And it's driven by um, values. Values, and John mentioned uh, this in the bio that you know, I guess someone wrote um, to help. Uh, but uh, first, and there are three, all right? First is about humility, all right? Now, a lot of ways to describe humility. This is the way I like to describe it. It's about caring about someone else first, which is about obligation before opportunity, okay? So here's a way to think about it. You're, you have a business and you, you, know, you wake up one day and the phone rings and you pick up, two phones ring, you pick them up. One is an existing customer, they got a problem. The other one's a customer, a new one that wants to buy something from you. What do you do first? This one, right? Obligation before opportunity, all right? And that's putting someone else first and caring about someone else first before what's in your interest, and that's this phone, okay? And that, to me, is the core of humility then. And when you have that as a value, it means a lot of other things in terms, terms of your behavior and who you are. Second is integrity. Now, you know, this is um, another one that has, you know, you could describe it in a lot of ways. But this is about always doing the right thing. And, um, and the right thing means as follows, all right? Follow the rules, and that means the ones that are written, the ones that are not written, that everybody knows are rules, by the way, all right? And the rules of common sense, okay? So it's not good enough to just follow the written rule, okay? Unwritten and common sense. And do that especially when it's the hardest thing to do. Because lots of times when people get in trouble on integrity, it's all about taking a shortcut. Because if I really do the right thing, it's harder. It takes more time, costs more money, makes me you know, give up something I don't want to give up. And uh, we just don't do that. And we don't allow people in the company to do that. And I tell everyone that joins Citrix this. If anyone ever asks you to do the wrong thing, the first thing you do is say no. And the second thing you do is you call me, All right? And so when the leader of a company says that, and guess what, everybody in between, and everyone in the company knows that, okay? And it, it's a check and a balance, and it, and it helps everyone stay on track and know that I'm expecting us to do the right thing always, even when it's the hardest thing, even when it costs more money, even when it costs more time, okay? That's really important. And then the third value is respect, okay? And this is an especially important one. And uh, the way I define respect uh, in business is uh, understanding that hierarchy is a necessary evil of managing complexity. Okay? Now, think about this. How many places do you go and it's like, hey, this guy's got a big title or this gal's got a big title, so they get more respect and this person's you know, got a small title as entry level, just started with the company, and they get, you know, commensurate respect with that, less. It's like, we don't do that, all right? That's what most companies do, <laughs> um, sort of associating respect with hierarchy, all right? So we don't do that because we accept that people have to have different titles and hierarchy to manage complexity, but it has nothing to do with the respect that each person in the company gets and is expected to give, okay? That's, that's what those three values are. So now how do you use these things to sponsor a culture that, you know, is that cult that, by the way, over 7,000 people in, you know, I don't know how many languages we speak around the world, but many, 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 many languages. Uh, how do you do that consistently across the world? Well. Here's how we do it. First of all, we find people 
that have these values, all right, and we're really picky about them. We're picky about them when they, we hire them, and we're picky about them when we acquire them. Really important, okay? Hire and acquire. Now, most of you are too young, but what you'll learn is that a very important rule of life is choosing well. Because if you choose well, then everything after that is much easier than if you don't choose well and you're always fixing it. So in a software company that's all about people, and innovation, et cetera, passion, you have to choose well, and this is how we choose well, by these values. And then on top of that, we can actually have all kinds of ways of doing things, which is what a culture is. A company culture is how a company gets things done. Okay, now, this is the way I think of it. All right, all right. People are the hardware, okay. The values are the operating system. And we want a common operating system across the company. And that's the values that we choose well around. And then on top of that, we can build all kinds of apps to do all the kinds of things we have to do in all the types of businesses that we're in. With virtual desktops, for example, cloud networking, cloud platforms, web collaboration, you know, remote access, et cetera, all right? So this is how we do it. And this is one piece of the formula. There's a second piece of the formula, and that's this, you know what you do for customers, all right? Um, what we do for customers, we help people live better and work better, all right? And by helping them solve big problems, like how do we make people mobile, okay? How do we evolve the enterprise data center to be more like a cloud? And how do we sort of power the build out of cloud services, all right? So, that's what we do. So you put these two things together every day over and over, this is what you're doing. You're delivering value to employees, great place to work, great place to grow, have a fantastic career and a lot of fun, okay? And then you add that to doing great things for customers because you care about them and you bring your imagination to them. It's a magical formula. And if you add these two things together, you get a lot of things. C employee value plus customer value equals shareholder value. That's sort of a you know, Wall Street thing, all right? But those two things equal a lot of fun, a lot of pride, all right? A lot of passion, and bringing a lot of really amazing people together uh, in a way that uh, you know, when you go to sleep at night, you feel really good about what you do, all right? So, and feeling good about what you do and believing is really important, all right? And uh, so, you know, Buddha said this, we become what we believe. And belief is a really powerful force in the universe. And this uh, expression from Buddha um, is uh, all about that. And if you believe in what you do, and if you have thousands of people that believe in what they do, because we have a common culture, a powerful culture, and uh, we have a great vision. It's amazing what happens, all right? So this is what happens. So now we have a company that, where we're number two in the world in web collaboration, go to meeting, all right? Uh, we're new in the data sharing market. Our newest, uh, one of our newest acquisitions, ShareFile, all right? So competing with Box and a lot of other uh, uh, Dropbox and some of those kinds of companies. Uh, we're number one in the world in virtual desktops and apps. We're number two in the world in cloud networking, all right? And we're an early and I think uh, powerful entrant in the cloud platforms market where there's no one that's number one or number two or number three. It's, a, it's right now it's a big food fight, okay? And uh, we're doing real well and, you know, the right scale guys here, a number of which are Citrix guys and Expert City guys, all right? We love a lot. And uh, they're part of uh, the food fight and we're on the same team together, all right? So this is Citrix today, you know, these great uh, high growth markets where we're bringing mobility and cloud services to people so that you can work better, live better. 
And uh, so this is our focus, mobile work styles, cloud services, and uh, so that people can work anywhere and s services, IT services can be made anywhere in a private cloud or a public cloud. And this is allowing us to deliver on our long-term mission, and this is it, okay? Uh, we have this core belief that people should be able to work and play from anywhere, all right? So that's an important binding element across everything that we have done and will do, because when people can work and play from anywhere, they can live better and work better, all right? And I love this picture, okay? So look at that picture. How many of you have jumped on a trampoline? Okay. So that's the moment, right? You jump, and you're there, and you're weightless. You're, you're suspended, right? And you're going to change direction. And uh, the feeling is amazing. And when you can work and play from anywhere, that's the feeling. That's why that, that, that picture is there, all right? Even though it kind of looks like an ugly, cloudy day in the Santa Inez Valley, you know, with the fog rolling in or something or whatever. So, um, that's our goal. That's our, you know, many, many multi-year mission as a company. All right, so, John, John sent me an email and he said, look, there's one thing I could, like, dream for and wish for is that, you know, my students leave this class, all right, and believe and feel like success, okay, is not something that happens to other people. That success is actually, you know, in your hands, okay? Now, it is, but I'll tell you, it's not entirely in your hands because it turns out that there are a number of, of things that are important here. So first, if you set out to make a fortune, you probably won't, okay? If you set out to make a difference in the world, you will, and you might make a fortune, okay? Number one. Number two, um, you gotta know what you're about, and you have to have a strategy for your life. And I think there are two fundamental strategies. There's one that I call connecting dots, and there's another one that's called paint by numbers. And I will describe these in a minute. But you gotta know which one you are, okay? And if you're one and you choose the other, you know, you're gonna have a problem, right? So you gotta be kind of realistic about who you are and the, the strategy that you, um, you create for yourself in your life. Um, third is that I think these are the three things that matter most. Curiosity, curiosity, persistence, and good fortune, you know. I'm a kind of a spiritual guy, not super religious guy, but a spiritual guy, and I think these are called blessings. All right. These are the things that you cannot control. So I can be persistent. I can be curious. I, that's me. That's about me and what I am about and what I can control. All right? But I can't possibly control blessings and good fortune. If, you know. So now, that can sound like a pretty desperate sort of thing, right? It's like, all right, I'm going to do my best, but if I don't get lucky, I'm, I'm hosed. No. Here's what it is. It's like if you ascribe and attribute over 50% of the outcome that you'll see in your life to good fortune, then what that will do is it'll first, really, first keep you humble, feet on the ground, all right? And secondly, it'll have you focus on the things that you can control. And when you focus on the things you can control, it's amazing how much good fortune you'll have. If that makes sense. Um, next is, uh, I think, always see yourself as a student and always understand that success is a work in process always in your life. Okay? So, John, I tried to put it on one page, okay? And um, so, this is my formula, you know, and my opinion, and now I'll try to, you know, uh, bring this to life a little bit, maybe on a personal basis. So, 
got to know, you got to have a strategy. All right, so it's kind of an ugly picture. It's very, really, really old. Um, so there's paint by numbers, all right? So, you know, when I was a kid, I had, you know, aunts and uncles, especially aunts that like to sort of bring gifts over at Easter or whatever, and they love bringing these paint by numbers, you know, sort of kits. And look at that. It's like, you can see what that is, right? It's, it's, it's a house and, you know, uh, with a nice front yard and maybe that's some snow on there or a walkway, I'm not sure or what it is, but, and I see all those numbers and I match those numbers to the, to the paints that are in the kit. And if I just sort of follow a prescribed course, I'm gonna get a good picture, all right? That's the picture of your life. That's the picture you're trying to create in your life. And that's one way to do it. Um, scientists, professional like doctors, <coughs> lawyers, this is, the, th this is the core strategy in a life like that, at least, you know, what sets people off in that direction, all right? I want to be X, and there's a prescribed way to do it. And so, you know, X is the picture, and the prescribed way are matching the numbers with the colors, okay? Um, the other one is connecting dots. Now, so it's like, hey, it's kind of cat in the hat, but you know, maybe this one is pretty obvious, but this is about starting in a place and getting to the next place and then figuring out what the next place is and the next place and the next place is, all right? And you know, to do that, you've got to actually you know, do a lot of things that are coming from a place that's not digital. It's coming from kind of the analog self. So first of all, choosing well. Choosing, making those incremental decisions around the next dot to go to. Now, um, how do you do that? Well, you have to have beliefs that, you, you know, that you're passionate about and, uh, and principles. Because what happens, you know, and what hap has happened in my life over and over again is, you know, this sort of ambiguity of things that happen it's like the only way to actually make good sequential decisions is to have a common set of principles you're always going back to, all right? And by the way, you know, when you're starting out, you don't have a lot. You know, you may have the ones that you are taking from home, all right? Or what you heard your mom or your dad say, or, or a professor, a mentor that you respect. That's great, you know? Uh, role models and copying other people that you respect and admire is an awesome way to go fast because you, then you don't have to reinvent the wheel, okay? So this is an important aspect of connecting dots. Uh, third, I talked a little bit about persistence but also practice. You know, um, there's a great book uh, called Outliers. Have any of you read it? Okay, okay. So there's an idea in the book about 10,000 hours, right? All right. That's practice. And the more you compress it, right, then, and the earlier you compress it in your career, the more you leverage it over the time of your career. And how do you do that? Well, passion for something that you love, right? Persistence, because it won't be easy, all right? Because mom or dad, you know, said, no, I want you to be this, not that or I want you to you know, get a, bit, a, a real job, not a startup job, or I don't, whatever, all right? So you gotta be very persistent and then practice, and that, there's no shortcut. It's thousands of hours, thousands and thousands of hours. You wanna be a great you know, pianist, violinist, it's thousands of hours. A great golfer, thousands of hours. A great entrepreneur, thousands of hours. A great software uh, engineer, thousands, et cetera, et cetera, you know, designer, artist. It doesn't matter. Practice, all right? Um, fourth is about family and mentors, all right, I believe. And that is to understand that, you, you know, a family is kind of the people that believe in you, that put you out there, all right, and help you bridge hard times and make it easier to be persistent. And mentors are the people who, you know, you're copying. Basically, it's like, hey, I respect that person or that company, and so I'm going to make my company or myself like that person, All right? Uh, I grew up in a really modest home. I, you know, my uh, dad's an electrician, all right? 
Uh, my parents still live in a 1,200 square foot home that you know grew up in. All right, and um, you know, uh, uh, you know, we're yeah, kind of a middle working class family. And so as I went along in my career, I found myself in places where I'd sit down to dinner and people were all dressed up and there were three forks on one side and three knives and two spoons and five glasses and I'm looking around saying, what do I do? Nobody ever taught me this stuff, right? And so what did, what did I do? I just sat back and I said, that guy or that woman or that guy, they, they've been here before, okay? And I'm going to follow their lead. Okay, so they picked up that fork. I picked up that fork. All right. So you know, maybe I didn't get to finish everything that was served because I was a little behind, but I learned. Right. So that's about mentors and role models, and you know how it's a shortcut to becoming something that you believe in. All right. Um, and then, as I said uh, earlier. You know, you got to have luck and have a lot of blessings along the way, okay? So this is what connecting dots is about. Now, most parents hate this because it's ambiguous, all right? Hey, you know, I didn't pay all this money for you to go to college to get out there and wander around as in an ambiguous world, you know? No, like, what are you going to be? What are you going to do? A lot of parents do that. Okay, and you know, that's uh, hard. It, it, it creates a hard situation. And uh, you know, we have three incredible children in their you know, late 20s, 28, uh, 26, and 25. And uh, you know, I'm a connect the dots kind of person. And uh, my bride of 32 years is a paint by numbers person. So my, our children have it tough, <laughs> all right? because they're sort of caught in the crossfire of these two fundamental ideas. But it's not what strategy is right, it's that if you're a paint by numbers person, go with it. You know, if you're a connect the dots person, go with it. It's just that oftentimes parents want you to be paint by numbers because it's less ambiguous, it seems more certain, okay? And therefore lower risk and parents want the best for their children. You know, no one wants their children to go through the hard times that they went through. But guess what? Everyone does. Everyone does. And so, you know, decide. And then once you have this model in your head, you know, it makes, it, it frees you, it sets you free. Because then it's like, no, this is how I'm going to do this. It's a strategy. It's a strategy. And we built a big company on this strategy, by the way. And I'll explain that in a minute. So when I think of sort of my career, I thought I'd share sort of maybe these four phases and touch on a few things. So I did go to North Carolina State University in Raleigh. Um, I, you know, I'm originally from North Carolina, my, uh, my family, and I did study product design. So I'm not an engineer, you know, et cetera. Um, I belonged to Lambda Chi um, uh, fraternity. And then when I graduated, um, I, I realized that I probably wasn't gonna be a product designer for all kinds of reasons, all right? So I took a job, and I was very disappointed in the beginning as a draftsman, okay, which is kind of an old school term, I guess, um, at a company called Hamlin Sheet Metal and Roofing Company, all right? So I'd you know, done all this you know, wonderful, creative work. I graduated top of my class, all those wonderful things in product design, and here I was sitting at a drafting desk drawing pictures of flashings for roofing, okay? And um, it was one of the best things that ever happened to me. You know why? Because I met a man <clears throat> named Fred Hamlin, okay, who uh, started this company. And he took an interest in me, all right? And uh, in your life when, you know, you kind of look back, you realize who took an interest and really did something special for you. And he taught me a lot of things, yes, about drafting and about technical and engineering related things, but he taught me, you know, to think out of the box and think big and not settle for something that I didn't really believe in long term in my heart. And, uh, and so Fred encouraged me to go to the next place, and that was to the University of Virginia. Um, where I uh, studied at the Darden School and got my MBA. So 
By the way, North Carolina State is an agriculture school, so that's where I got my agriculture, and UVA is a different kind of school, and that's where I got my culture, all right? That's kind of a Atlantic, Atlantic Coast Conference joke, you know, but, all right, so, um, so I, you know, got my MBA at, at uh, the University of Virginia, and uh, in those days, uh, um, MBAs were really special degrees. In fact, that year that I got my MBA, I think in, uh, in the U.S., there were 5,000. Um, uh, today, there are about 100,000 a year, okay? So, so what, what does that mean? Well, anyone who got an MBA, you know, kind of felt you were a captain of industry and you were out to conquer the world of business, et cetera, and the expectations were high. And I went to work. I had seven job offers and I went to work for Rubbermaid Industrial Products, okay? Um, and what, what, you know what we made? You know those green trash cans that, ha uh, that on wheels with the lid? Okay, that's what we made, all right? Not much to believe in there, right? But why did I go? They gave me a fantastic offer for money. And, you know, um, it, that was sort of the culture of the school, you know, you kind of, invested this time and energy, so go where you get the biggest payback. So that's where I went. In six months, I realized I had made a huge mistake, all right, because the culture of the company was kind of shiny suits and blue suede shoes. And, you know, not, I just couldn't believe in that. And I just didn't let my heart, you know, kind of get involved here and take the job I should have taken, which was about a job where I believed in the people, okay? And, um, and the reason it was painful, it goes something like this, you know? So I go through all this, and MBA school, captain of industry, the very first decision I had to make, what happened? I screwed up. The first decision, the first significant decision uh, coming out of MBA school, I screwed up, all right? So, that felt really bad. But you know what? When you, re when you tell yourself the truth and you say, I screwed up, then the next thing you, go, you should say is, I'm gonna do something about it. So fail fast and then and do something about it. Take action. That was the lesson, all right? And culture and people matter more than the things that you're actually building. So, you know, I went to work for, from here, I went to work for Boise, let's see, did I, all right, yeah. So then that led me to the sort of the third sort of era of my career, where I was in the forest products business, believe it or not. So I went to work for Boise Cascade Kitchen Cabinet Division, all right? We manufactured kitchen cabinets, all right? And I was in marketing, sales and marketing. And uh, the people were just fantastic, all right? Uh, the culture was awesome and people cared about each other. And I learned a tremendous amount about, you know, uh, distribution networks and so forth, dealer networks and selling indirectly and all that good stuff. And in fact, um, um, I, went to a, I went to a trade show and, uh, where I had kitchen cabinets uh, to, uh, to, to sell to uh, kitchen and bath remodelers. And, um, and there was this really beautiful girl about three exhibits down that was with Formica Corporation, and guess what she had? Countertops. <laughs> a match made in heaven, all right? <laughs> so I met her on Monday, all right, during the setup, and on Wednesday, I asked her to marry me, okay? And uh, so, why am I telling you that? It's because the best decisions I've ever made in my life were the ones that came from intuition, all right? And as you, as you are younger in your career, you know, your, your bosses, et cetera, your parents will hold you to high digital standards because no one believes that you have enough intuition yet to make important decisions, okay? So, you know, notwithstanding that, the best decisions I've made in my life and career are the ones that are strongly coming from instinct. It's just that, it can't only be instinct, right? It can't only be instinct. So, important. 
So then that led to the next thing, and that's a home. Like, and that's a big commitment, you know, a mortgage, et cetera. And that's when you had to actually get serious about life because you don't sign up for a mortgage and the commitment uh, uh, there, um, you know, idly. And uh, so that sort of set us off, and we had two careers, and so we could do that. And uh, that led to the next, you know, sort of piece. And I started a company called American Millwork with a partner. And uh, this fellow, his name's Vaughn Nickel, a wonderful, wonderful man. And uh, he was the manufacturing guy, and I was the sales and marketing guy. So we had this factory, and what we made was wood moldings. You know, like, that go around doors. You know, crown molding, you know, baseboard, things like that. And in that kind of business, you bring in sort of raw lumber in one end, and it comes from trees that God grows in random lengths and rough, et cetera. And out the other end, you have to ship finished products. But you have to sell everything, everything including the sawdust, okay, the knots. Um, you have to sell all the pieces that you cut off. So, you know, it's a tricky business, and there's a lot of math involved, it turns out. And I was pretty good in math. So <clears throat> I told my partner, hey, this little IBM, this act actually was the original compact, you know, luggable computer, is uh, running a spreadsheet, was not enough to actually get us to where we needed to go to schedule the factory. And I told him we needed some real software and a real computer to do it. And he said, well, how are we going to do that? And I said, I will write the software. And he said, do you know how to do that? I said, no. But how hard could it be? <laughs> All right? So, you know, curiosity and being able to sort of invent something that you needed was an important, you know, aspect of sort of thinking out of the box and getting the next step. You know what I learned? I learned that, you know, I went after a short while and I failed. I started with uh, mumps as a, you know, programming language <laughs> class. <laughs> it was there, you know, completely, I couldn't figure it out, you know. So I ended up going to a kind of a two second generation language that I could handle. I built it on Macintosh because it was a true 32-bit architecture and we needed to grind through tremendous amount of data doing uh, 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 linear regressions and, and all um, to come out with an optimal schedule for the factory. And what I learned, I told my partner, hey Vaughn, it's like I love you man, but I love software way more. And that's where I'm going. I don't know how I'm getting there, but that's where I'm going, all right? And so um, then, uh, our family started to come along, and that, you know, created another level of commitment. And thankfully, um, my wife um, really carried us through those years. You know, for years, she made much more money than I did uh, in her career. And um, we had, like, insurance, health insurance, and I was doing startups and trying all kinds of things, right? And, you know, so having a great partner in life turns out to be a really important it was a really important, uh, has been, and still is a critical, critical thing. That led actually to the sort of the end of this era um, where I decided, you know, I don't know how to get into the software business. So what I'll do is I'll start an Apple dealership, okay? And so I went and got a part-time job in uh, the uh, Christmas season of 1984 and uh, sold Macintoshes, okay, part-time, like Thursday night, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, whatever, you know, the store was open. And I learned about being an Apple dealer and then made an application to Apple and a partner and I started an Apple dealership. And that got us into the technology, that got me into the technology industry and business, but as an Apple dealer, okay. And I joined the School of Insanely Great you know, uh, and, uh, where Steve Jobs was headmaster, and we sold a lot of desktop publishing, you know, Macs and uh, laser writers and uh, page maker software and all the things you needed to do, you know, professional desktop publishing. So that's kind of what ended, uh, ended the wood era of my life and led to the start of the technology era, uh, which uh, started in 1986. Uh, started with uh, my first software company. Um, the product was called Syzygy. Does anyone know what a Syzygy is? Yes, sir. 
Yeah, it's, uh, you know, all right, good. That's the right direction. Does anyone know? Okay. A syzygy is when the sun, the earth, and the moon are in alignment. Okay. That's what a syzygy is. And by the way, it's an interesting word because, and, you know, not everyone considers Y a vowel. All right. So check that word. It's the only word, I think, that has three Ys in it. All right. And no vowels. Kind of, sort of. All right. But, um, and by the way, that venture was a failure. Okay? It was a total failure. We ran out of money. We built the company up to 33 people and then ran out of money. I couldn't raise money, more money. I was a failure and had to lay off everyone, including myself. All right? And it felt really bad because I let a lot of people down that I made a lot of commitments to that we were on the same team. And, uh, um, but along the way, I was very lucky and uh, uh, met a mentor who had been one of the top uh, guys at IBM had, and had retired after 28 years with IBM. His name was Bert Goldberg. And uh, Bert, you know, uh, befriended me and advised me, never asked me for anything, not even to buy him a cup of coffee, all right? He was just a good man that cared. He, uh, I knew him for two years before he died, tragically, um, of a massive heart attack. But Bert told me one day something that's really guided my life, and that is, he said, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. So what does that mean? You know, when he said that, I didn't really know what he meant, all right? But what I've come to understand is that, you know, life in your career has high points and low points. And you can over-rotate at the top and at the bottom. But don't. Stay grounded. Keep your feet on the ground. And always chop wood and carry water every day, regardless if times are great, if times are bad. If you can figure it out or you can't figure it out, it's like, be the same. Okay. And, uh, you know, Burt uh, was a guy that also introduced me to a company called Land Systems, where I met um, my next uh, uh, person that stuck, touched my life, and that was someone, not a mentor, but a believer, someone who believed in me, actually, probably more than I believed in myself, all right? And I worked for this guy, and we, his name's Tyrone Pike, and uh, we sold Land Systems to Intel Corporation, all right? And, um, Tyrone went to work for Intel, and I set off on a different course. But Tyrone ended up being a board member at Citrix, which is how I got introduced to Citrix. Because he believed in me, and he believed in me enough to promote me to the CEO of Citrix in uh, 1993, um, which is when um, I first met um, Roger Roberts as the CEO. I did the first interviews in 1993, and I was rejected. The team didn't like me. I didn't have a big enough resume, okay? And it's like, okay, because I don't want to join a team that doesn't want me. Really key thing. I don't want a team that doesn't want me. So I don't want to join a team that doesn't want me, even if I can kind of work my way in. And I don't want to stay on a team that doesn't want, uh, want me, okay? Really important, because guess what? Everyone is wasting time if you're on a team that doesn't want you or you're on a team that you don't want. Okay. So uh, then uh, I got a phone call about a year and a half later, and Roger said, hey, how would you like to come back? And I said, no. All right. And uh, he said, really, why not? I said, because we moved to California, and you're in Florida, and we're done. All right. So he kept calling me, persistence. All right. And uh, so I finally convinced my wife that, hey, let's go to Florida and we'll take another look and it'll be like a long Memorial Day weekend. It's a free flight to Florida and we'll, you know, go to the beach or something. And so, um, you know, from that, you know, Roger made all the, the both of us sign a document that basically was the offer. And, you know, he wrote it all down on a legal pad, put three X's. Uh, and I said, what's that third one? Go, go get Yvonne, your wife because she's going to sign this too, all right? 
you know, important, you know, getting the family commitment. And I've used that recruiting technique about a thousand times since then, right? Because you want everyone on board. And, you know, if a family is unhappy, but the kind of employee is, it's not going to work. It just doesn't work. Because no one can be their best when their family isn't believing and promoting them. Um, and uh, then, uh, you know, John said some nice things, and you know, I, he was VP of marketing when I joined. And um, Roger had told me that, look, after two years, two years after we go public, which happened quickly after I joined, I joined in June of 95, and we went public in December, Roger said, IPO plus two years, I'm retiring. And he never, you know, said anything that he didn't really mean, and he kept every promise uh, that he ever made. <clears throat> Talk about a, a mentor and, you know, someone that you can admire. And uh, he's been the biggest mentor in my life, right? Uh, the, the man, Roger Roberts, that hired me. And uh, so um, when he announced that, it's like, okay. You know, it's like, we'll see what happens because, uh, you know, the board will, you know, bring uh, a CEO in. And I got encouraged to put my name in the hat, all right? And I didn't really want to be CEO because I was having a great time being head of marketing, and I had failed at CEO. So why would I do that? Because I don't know how to do that. And I got enough encouragement from the team and my family to put my name in the hat. And Roger said, okay, I will put your name in the hat, but you have to make one promise, that if the board doesn't select you, uh, that you will not leave the company. I said, that's easy. I don't want the job anyway. All right? So I could, you know, I, I made that promise. And, you know, I, my name got pulled from the hat, I guess, and um, that was 1998. Uh, in, uh, so in, uh, in 1999, actually, I was named CEO, president in 98, 99, CEO. And then uh, in June of 2000, um, we completely blew up the company because we completely missed our revenue forecasts and profit forecasts, and we lost about 60% of our market value uh, in June uh, of 2000. And guess what? Somebody was responsible. That was me. All right. I had made lots of mistakes um, and, uh, you know, big ones that were about communicating with the board of directors of the company. And I believe that if I told the board what my problems were, they would say, wait a minute, we don't need a CEO that has problems. We need a CEO that you know, has solutions. And that was exactly the wrong thing to do. Okay. So what did I learn? <clears throat> I learned that the smartest people in the world ask for the most advice. The dumbest people in the world carry the load all by themselves. You know, think about it. It's like, gee, if I ask that question, that means I don't know the answer, and, therefore, and I'm expected to know the answer, so I'll disappoint the board. Right? No. It's like curiosity, you know, being truthful about what you know, and don't carry all that load. Get help. You know, when you have a problem, ask for help. That was the lesson. Right? But unfortunately, uh, when you lose 60% of your market cap overnight, June 12th of 2000, you know, um, then uh, you know, you're going to be held accountable. So at the next board meeting, which was a month later, uh, the board came in, heard my story, said, OK, uh, here's what we're going to do. You're now senior executive officer and president, and we're going to go out and look for a CEO. OK? And I said, Okay, I screwed up, and I'm paying for it. And so, but I'm going to take accountability for this because I ran us into this ditch, all right, and I'm going to get us out. Um, a year later, um, I was offered the job back, and uh, I took it instantly, all right. And we were growing again, and what looked like a terrible situation turned out to be not so terrible. But because I didn't ask for help when I needed it, all right, and when it was most important for the board to know, I didn't do it. All right. So ask for help when you need it. It shows confidence. It shows something special and character in you when you ask for help. 
and not try to carry the load all by yourself. Um, and so that was redemption, okay? Um, I'm reinstate, being reinstated. And the redemption has been about, you know, all the ma amazing things that have happened at Centrix since then. You know, for me personally on this amazing journey, all right, which I pinch myself daily about, all right, and uh, the amazing people that I've been privileged to work with and lead and a team I've, you know, privileged to be part of. So <clears throat> there's a... Uh, a lot of people want to, you know, kind of, you know, so I, I want to make a fortune and I want to, I want power. I want organizational power. I want power. I want to be powerful. You might not say that in your mind, but that's what a lot of people kind of think. Here's my advice. The most powerful thing you can ever be is yourself. All right? It's one of the hardest things to be because you got to know yourself, all right? And you got to be comfortable with that. And that means knowing where you're weak, where you're strong, all right, where you can be confident in the things that you know and the decisions you make and where you need a lot of help. And so being yourself will, always, will never, never do you wrong because being yourself is about being authentic, you know, being kind of naked in the world, all right, and, you know, being out, putting yourself out there in a way that's genuine. And when you're genuine and authentic in yourself, a whole bunch of people will care about you. You know, people that you have no idea that you're going to intersect with right now. You, you can't plan that, all right? But what you can do is be this, and you'll be out there ready for success. All right, so John, <laughs> John mentioned this uh, picture. So, you know, when we, we've done all these acquisitions, all right? And a lot, by the way, most acquisitions fail in the world. Most of them do, all right? And the reason they fail are a lot of reasons, but one of the big reasons is they, uh, the acquiring company sees themselves as the winner. We won, you guys lost. You know, we, we bought you, and so you got to do everything our way, okay? And so we don't think, we've never thought that. Well, we did, you know, because we made a mistake, a big one in, in 2001 that I'll skip over right now. But the way we think about this is we ask teams that fit our culture and our vision and our strategy as a company to join ours. Right? That's what we do. We do it today. And it's been a really successful formula because you choose well, and it's like we are one team, and so join, let's join teams. So I like to talk about mergers, not acquisitions, all right? We merge together. And so um, it's actually been quite uh, successful. And, you know, I try to talk with teams, you know, long before we actually do a deal, et cetera, and, you know, talk about our philosophies and how we run Citrix and our culture, et cetera. So I haven't shown this picture in many years, by the way, but this is a picture of me, NC State, September 1972, okay? And uh, there I am, all right. Uh, boy, I had a hair, I had a hair. Let's zoom in there, all right. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you know, so um, there, there I was, and uh, and so you know, I when I show this to John, and I look at it now, and I feel the same way. It's like I'm still that person, okay. My body is a lot older, <laughs> but I'm still that person, all right. Um, I'm that person that has optimism, okay? I see a, a better future all the time. I'm always thinking about a better future, okay? I'm an optimist, all right? Um, which leads to a smile, all right? And uh, as the saying goes, smile. It increases your face value, okay? <laughs> so, you know, but smiling is, you know, the person within, all right? And it's that optimism, all right? And so that's the same. And the third thing is down here, all right? I, I still am passionate about technology, making a difference in the world, helping people work better and live better, all right? And doing it, you know, in a genuine way where it's like, it's not about money. It's about doing something good that I believe in. So, you know, so be yourself, okay? And, you know, celebrate it this way, all right? And then. Make sure you get these pictures so that when you're up here, 
you know, 10 or 15 years from now, you can, you know, put up a picture like that. Okay. There was, so let me just kind of, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I'm just going to kind of connect this now with Citrix going forward, and then, you know, it's getting a little bit late. I don't want to keep you all too late, but so connecting dots is a scary thing, all right, because it's about uncertainty, and no one likes uncertainty. No one likes ambiguity, but when we look at the world and look at the sky, you know, we kind of see ourselves in a unique way, all right? So first, we have this core belief that we call anyness, all right? You know, work anywhere, run IT systems and services anywhere, collaborate anywhere, connect anything to anything. So we have this like core belief in anyness and it's sort of fundamental. Um, we have, as a culture, comfort with ambiguity. So. So you look out there, it's like, I don't know exactly how it's all going to turn out, right? If you need to be definitive, you need to be a paint-by-numbers person. But if you're comfortable with ambiguity, you can, you know, really enjoy the journey that is about connecting dots. And we as a company have comfort with ambiguity. And third is we have aspirations. Those are great, but they're honorable and honorable aspirations are about the integrity and care around doing the right thing and doing great things for customers. So this is, you know, kind of the guiding light for Citrix as we look into a future that's pretty scary, by the way. If you look at what's going on in the software and the technology industry, it's a pretty scary world of change. So when we look at that, you know, we choose to see the stars that makes sense to us, the pattern that makes sense to us, and we put them together into a kind of a strategy that allows us to see the world through the lens that we choose to see it through. And then we see those points of light as the dots that we can con connect to draw a picture that allows us to grow, okay? Allows us to do special things and to change the world. And allows us to violate, you know, law, uh, one of the most powerful laws of the universe, and that's inertia. I used to think inertia was the most powerful force in the universe. Why? Because inertia is about doing what you did yesterday because, hey, it worked out, right? And if you get up every day and you do what you did yesterday, all right, uh, it, and because it worked out, then when the world changes, you're going to run off a cliff. And, but what makes it so powerful, it seems safe, comfortable, I'm sure, I get it. I know how that comes out, all right? But it makes it powerful. But I've decided it's the second most powerful force in the world because belief actually trumps everything, okay? So in all of history, think about in all your history, you know, studies in your life, you know, or sports history or, you know, kind of human history. The team or the country or the group or whatever that believed the most won. That believed in themselves and their ideas the most, they won. Because in the end, belief does trump everything, all right? So here's the formula. Belief, okay? And the force of belief is greater than the powerful forces of inertia. And so what, you know, we're doing to go from where we are today to five billion and beyond, all right, in terms of scale and impact, all right, is to take these five big ideas that we have and put them together now in some really unique ways so that what we can do is express the Citrix of the future as a company that's greater than the sum of its parts, okay? And that's how, you know, we'll you know, keep this amazing journey of many thousands of people, many thousands of people who have their hands, their lives, their spirits in it, and we'll keep it going for a long, long time, long beyond my time. And that's my biggest dream at this point in my life for Citrix. So now I will stop and we'll, you know, have some, some more discussion as you wish, okay? So thank you.
right, great talk. Thank um, you. I'm, you know, I'm kind of in a weird place for, in my life where I think, you know, I'm, I'm kind of going in a wrong direction and I'm, I'm connecting the wrong dot. Okay. Do you ever believe there's a dot that's almost too far away in the opposite direction? Um, Is there such a thing? Well, yes, but so one of the reasons I choose that leaf, okay, to kind of express that, is if you think about it, it's like everyone wants to go up and to the right. You know, all the great charts of the world are up and to the right, grow, a straight line that way. But lots of times, the best thing to do is to go back, to track back, all right? So when I think of my career, it's like some of the best things I ever did was to track back, all right? So take a lesser job where I could learn more, okay? To take myself off the grid of, you know, being a, you know, running something and, and, and going to advising someone, all right? Or changing from wood to technology. But the key thing is, is to, you know, once you know it here, do it, all right? Because, you know, naturally people want to think about things and, you know, kind of mull them over. Some people say, all right, what's the job of CEO, all right? Here's the answer, it's simple. My job, is to make sure that we turn gray into black or white. Either one, all right, either one. So gray is about, gee, I don't know, and I'm unsure, and you know, you know it all depends, and you know, tons of analytics, and all kinds of analysis and paralysis, when in the end, you gotta do something, because that's the best way to learn and find out. Right? So turning gray to black or white. So it's like, hey, black or white. I'm not saying one or the other, but that's action. All right? So that's what I suggest. So it sounds like you know you're in gray. All right? And so get out there and do it. And one of the, it's one of the things that one of my mentors taught me is like, always ask yourself, like, what's the worst thing that could happen? And you know, in the end, when you, if you actually try to write that down, and by the way, it's really good to write things down, for, you know, just write it down instead of in your head. Because see, when you write, you can't mumble. In, the, in your brain, you can mumble, right? Um, and you write, what's the worst that could happen? Worst thing that could happen. Three of the worst things, like if this is, you know, if I go wrong, you'll, what you'll say is like, that's not so bad. And then that'll give you the courage and confidence to do it. So not knowing your specifics, you know, that's, kind of how I'd answer your question. Okay. Right here. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask you earlier, um, you were talking about culture and kind of promoting this sense of culture within the company, mm -hmm. but how do you go from like, you know, letting everyone know that comes in about the culture to promoting the culture throughout the years? And also my second question is, uh, what is the biggest thing that you've ever given up to, to go either black or white, you know, to find your path? And, and how did you go about that? Okay, wow. Okay, so the first one is, uh, great question. So, so you live it. You live it. That's the first thing you do, all right? And, you know, and I actually ask people, you know, you gotta, you gotta walk the talk. It can't just be on a web page, okay? It's gotta be kind of how things, how you do things and everyone does, and you're accountable to that. So that's number one, and that means managers have to, you know, kind of hold people accountable to the, to the culture. Number two is the hiring sort of process I talked about. And turns out, and you know, that, you know, thousands and thousands of people in the company are involved in the hiring process. So, you know, if you're not involved, you're probably an exception. You know, you're probably, you know, maybe newer or for some reason you're not yet involved. So that's the second way to do it. And that's a continuous process. You're always hiring. And then the third thing is you gotta talk about it. You gotta celebrate it. And it's gotta be, you know, in communicated in over and over and over in everything you do, both in word and deed. So, you know, I'm chief culture officer as well. And uh, you know, just like I'm I'm talking to you the way I talk to, you know, our team um, about it, uh, with with, you know, with, with more, you know, context and content. But, um, and then people know it's important. And by the way, you know, we talked about ideals and all that sort of thing. I believe that, you know, in this sort of day and age, people are looking for a magnetic north in, in, in their lives. Because if you look at 
you know, sports heroes that, you know, are idiot, idiots or uh, politicians that turn out to be idiots and all this sort of thing. It's like, who, who do you believe in, right? You can believe in, don't believe in me, because it's not about me. You know, at Citrix we have a saying, we're the world's largest rock band. We don't believe in rock stars, all right? So we're the biggest rock band, all right? And, and people, you know, you believe in that, right? And that's something that's like, I belong to that, right? And that's a guiding light. And uh, we talk about it that way in every time we can, all right? And leaders in the company talk about it, et cetera, and that's how you propagate it globally, by the way. So you go to China, you know, you, you know, go to our team in Beijing, Shanghai, you go to, we have, uh, you know, about 1,000 uh, people in Bangalore, India, you know, it's all the same. It's amazing, actually, because it's a universal idea of respect, integrity, humility. Those are universal. Uh, no question? Ah, your second question about like, what did I give up? Uh, uh, I kind of skirted that one because I'm not sure I can answer it really well. Maybe I'll think about it a little bit, you know, kind of background process it. All right. Sir. Uh, yes, so, so my question is basically is very simple. Um, what are some strategies that you found successful in, wor in, in being, you're probably a bank robber yourself, but in working with teams that have ATM operators as part of the team, what do you find successful strategies? Well, you know, so what John was talking about was you know, me helping him to understand what, his, what motivates him, okay? So it's not about being a bank robber and doing something bad. It's about, you know, being motivated more by, you know, the economic kind of uh, aspects than maybe, you know, relative to myself, all right? And it doesn't make it wrong or right. It's just that, you know, it's about knowing and being yourself, all right? And so helping John sort of kind of get in touch with that and making it okay for John to say, hey, that's, that's what I'm about, so that's what I'm gonna go do. It's like, fantastic, right? We're friends forever, right? Because that's what friends do. You know, when you care about someone, all you know, right, in that way, then, you know, that's what you get. So, you know, we have lots of gene pools in the company that, you know, kind of at the higher levels that sort of those apps, you know, people can have those motivations because if you're a salesperson, you want to be motivated by, e you want them to be motivated by economics, okay? If you're a developer, you want them to be motivated by creativity and innovation and invention, you know? So those are all, those things are, there are lots of gene pools that are, that are high up, okay? And um, they coexist beautifully because the values are clear, you know, simple, straightforward, and are good, you know, and, and so, um, and, and that's what we, you know, you kind of, so there's John, you know, has those values, all right? So it's okay for John to be, you know, kind of motivated by economics, it's okay. It's just that he's got to know that, all right, and go with that, all right? Uh, but John was, a, you know, we couldn't have done the deal. Klaus is sitting there, the, you know, one of the founders of, of uh, Expert City and, you know, kind of the lead, the lead guy, you know, uh, and he knows exactly we wouldn't have gotten this done without John's amazing blood and sweat, you know, uh, to get it done and to make it successful, as a matter of fact. You know, so, so that's, that's how I'd answer your question. It's okay, but you got to get that OS layer right.